You've probably seen it in the headlines before. We are more polarized than ever. Politics, the climate, the shape of the earth, people are disagreeing about all of it, and that can take a real toll on our everyday lives, at work and at home. So how do we deal with all these polarizing beliefs? For that, we're turning to Leanne Davey. Known as the teamwork doctor, she's advised hundreds of teams on how to work together effectively, and her newest book, The Good Fight, is all about conflict. Today, she joins us to offer her thoughts and advice on how we can disagree with others in a more productive way. Thanks so much for joining us, Leanne. Oh, hi, Meg. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So when I first spoke to you about this conversation, (laughs) I was looking for advice on how to agree to disagree, and I was so surprised to hear that you aren't actually a fan of that phrase at all. Can you tell me why you don't like it? (laughs) Yeah, agree to disagree. Um, the word agree just adds no value in that phrase. It's just let's just disagree. Let's just keep disagreeing. And and that means let's just stay misaligned. Let's just uh, keep this, you know, open wound in our relationship or in our plans. So agree to disagree in the vast majority of cases is a cop out and it it means that we're kind of stuck and uh, and that's why I really really don't like that phrase. Yeah, so I can see how uh, when we first spoke you talked about how agreeing to disagree is particularly harmful in the workplace. Yes. But maybe not in personal relationships. Can you explain the difference? Yeah. So let's start with the workplace. So in the workplace, we have to make decisions. We have to make difficult trade-offs and we have to do things that allow us to act. That's what makes us effective in organizations. And so if we agree to disagree, it, it could be a couple of scenarios. It may be a situation where we share accountability for something and agreeing to disagree means we're just not going to make the call and we're not going to move forward. And organizations can't afford to have that kind of inertia or to be stuck in that way. Another possibility is one person owns the decision and they've decided what they think is the best path forward. The other person doesn't own the decision, doesn't have really the right to change the decision, but has come right out and said, basically reading between the lines, I'm not going to support your decision. I'm not going to lift a finger to make sure your decision and your plan is successful. And I'm going to be really happy to say, I told you so when it doesn't work out. So neither of those things is healthy in an organization. So what we really want is to be clear on who owns a given decision. And when they own that decision, even if other people have provided information or other opinions or have advocated strongly for a different decision, once the decision is made, we want to switch from agree to disagree into disagree and commit. Here's why I didn't agree with that decision, but here's what I'm going to do to make sure that your plan works out. So that's what we all want is to work in an organization where we're contributing to it being successful, not dragging our feet. Now, in personal relationships, there may be more situations where agreeing to disagree is okay. Um, Agreeing to disagree about what to watch on Netflix, (laughs) you know, agreeing to disagree of, you know, who played the best Batman, that's a hot one, Um, et cetera, et cetera. And there may be situations where it's okay. At the same time, it may be that similarly, agreeing to disagree means we're going to agree to leave this rift in our relationship. We're going to agree to keep holding a grudge about a call that one or another of us made. And that's not healthy in a personal relationship either. So where it's possible to be able to say, you know, this wasn't the movie that I would have chosen for tonight, but all right, I'm going to go in and I'm going to have fun with it. And I'm going to, I'm going to, try and enjoy myself, you can disagree and commit in personal kinds of situations as well. So just remember, if you're saying agree to disagree, you're saying I'm agreeing to leave this open wound. And anywhere where you don't want to leave an open wound, you don't want to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. You have a specific phrase in your new book that I really love, facts don't solve fights. (laughs) Uh, And I can see how... um, 
this can really play out in a fight, especially when we're disagreeing about something that we feel we have tangible facts about, like vaccinations or... (laughs) For example, vaccination. (laughs) Or the shape of the earth even, right? Yes. yes. Um, So what do you mean by facts don't solve fights? Yeah. So it turns out that humans are not particularly um, uh, rational decision makers. And particularly when we get into a fight, it's not about the facts. It's about something a couple of layers beneath the facts, which is if you're actually having conflict that's unpleasant, it's it's something aversive, you are actually having a fight about values, about beliefs, about things that matter. And you know what we do as humans is, is we kind of decide what we like and what we want to do based on what we value, what we feel about something. And then we conveniently curate a set of facts to make us feel good about how we feel. So if I don't want to get vaccinated for whatever reason, it, it may be something as simple as I don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> like something, and I think for a lot of people, that is what it is. I don't want somebody to tell me what to do. And um, then what we do is we find, you know, well, the AstraZeneca shot created blood clots. We, that's a convenient, yes, it's true. It might've been in one in 600,000 cases or whatever. And we, we neglect a lot of facts about vaccinations we already have, like the tetanus vaccination or something like that. Um, and, and we collect these facts until we're like, mm, okay, I've got a good case here. But the issue is actually not about the facts. And so what happens is when we try and solve a fight with facts, we say, you know, we we share the AstraZeneca data or whatever else. Or we say, now we have the mRNA vaccines available for everybody and they don't have that problem. Well, the thing is, it was never about the facts. And so what the person is motivated to do is find a bunch of new facts. Well, what about this? And what about that? They get really creative about poaching facts that work for them, or they just retrench to something very emotional because you've made them feel uh, invalidated. You, <laughs> this was always about being forced to do something they didn't want to do, or maybe not even something they didn't want to do, just plain being forced to do something they don't like. So facts don't solve spites is Don't bother trying to find yourself. Don't publish the latest science article on their Facebook feed. It's not going to work. Instead, ask questions to understand, you know, how are you imagining this? What what does this mean to you? How do you interpret this? What uh, do you think are the risks of moving this way? Try and understand the person's values and then, then you've got a hope at solving the fight. That's the layer at which fights really happen is what we believe, what we value, what matters to us. And facts are just thrown into the mix as distractions. Right. Uh, what I love about that approach of asking questions is it requires us to catch ourselves um, and and notice what we're doing when we start throwing things that right. we have seen and heard and it makes us stop and and think well what's actually going on with the other person and vice versa it's a two-way street absolutely and it's okay if you start to get it wrong you know there's a lot of baiting going on in the world right now and so if if you sort of lose your cool and if you start you know picking away at their facts it's okay to just stop and say I'm not sure this is what this is about. Sorry, let me do over. Like, can can we just let me know how you're thinking about this? What does it mean to you when when you hear that you have to get a vaccination to go to the gym or, you know, those sorts of things, right? So it's okay when we get it wrong. I think the problem for a lot of people is that they think they have to have their approach to conflict perfect, the perfect thing to say, the perfect rebuttal. In many ways, we, when we're vulnerable, when we mess it up, when we ask for a second chance, we strengthen the trust with somebody else. If, if somebody actually, think about a left wing and a right wing person these days, if, if the left wing person at some point in the conversation is like, you know what, I'm totally missing the point here. I, I would love to understand how, how you perceive this, what matters to you. The person be like, what? They actually want to, it, it increases the trust level. So don't worry about getting everything right. 
when you get it wrong, take a breath and just say, that's not how I want to have this conversation. I'm really sorry. I was, you know, I was preaching instead of listening. I'm going to put duct tape over my mouth, like <laughs> give you, give you a chance to, to tell me how you feel about this. So that's, uh, that's a key thing. Don't worry about getting it perfect. Just be authentic. And when you get it wrong, say so. Yeah. Great advice. So we're having this disagreement and I'm asking you how you feel. You're asking me how I feel. We're building this trust, but how do we know when we've resolved the disagreement? I think sometimes yeah. we go round and round in circles. And I guess to piggyback off of that, do we actually need to resolve all disagreements or do I just feel that way? Cause I don't like conflict. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. And it's one of the things that I think has been really challenging as we've been in the video environment. So if you think about having a, a conflict in the workplace, there are a lot of subtle signs that help you know that you're getting to the other side of a conflict. So one is, you know, the person walks past your desk because <laughs> it's amazing how when you're having a conflict, how they find a route through the office that allows them to avoid your desk. And suddenly all of a sudden they walk past your desk again. You're like, okay, at least they're not full on avoiding me. Um, eye contact is another really important thing. You know, when things are really tough, and this is a big one for me, I do this all the time. When things are really tough, we don't have eye contact with the other person. And when that eye contact starts to come back, you're like, okay, we're getting to the other side of this. So there's subtle cues that when we're in a remote world, we don't have. We don't have those cues to know that, oh, things are warming back up again. The frost is thawing. It's okay. So that is an important thing. It, it may mean that you need to, you know, have some kind of casual interactions. You know, if you're in a video meeting and you can do a personalized chat to that person that just is a bit of a trial balloon of where are we at. So there's all of that sort of interpersonal, where are we in the conflict? But in terms of the content of the conflict, um, I trial uh, a, a close. So what if we were to do this? Um, how would it land if we, you know, resolved it this way? What if I were to do this? Like, so test it with an open-ended question about would this work for you? Then if the person is like, yeah, that'll be fine. Then you know that you're in a good spot. You might want to add on, do you want to revisit this in a couple of weeks and make sure we're comfortable with it? That gives an, a, an extra round of security because the person knows that if it's not working, they have a chance to, to talk about it again. But basically you're doing the trial close. And in the trial close, the, the good thing is you're not sort of asserting that this is what we're doing and, and kind of making it adversarial. You're testing to see, is the person receptive to that as a resolution? And if yes, great. If no, then you got to go back to, okay, what do we still have to solve for? What did this plan not include that's important to you? What risks are still in this version? So you go back to, um, back to questions, back to understanding what's their truth that you haven't yet <laughs> reflected in the solution. Um, and do you have to resolve all conflicts? No, I'm I'm a big believer that there's some threshold of things that, you know what, it's okay. You know, in relationships, there's some level of stuff that you kind of let it go. It's like, it's not a big deal. And as long as the eye contact is coming back and those sorts of things, you're like, okay, this, this one's all right. It's not a big deal, but it's a smaller percentage than you think, you know, that's maybe 10% of conflicts. The rest, you actually do want to work through them because they don't go away. If you don't, <laughs> they're still there. So kind of ask yourself, if I let this one go, will it affect, you know, the, the tone I use when I read their next email? Will I read their next email like they're a villain, <laughs> like with that narrator in my head, or will it be fine? If I'm not going to let this go, then I got to work it to resolution. But so for a small number, sure. Like there's stuff that, and the other thing to ask yourself is, is this really about the issue or is this about me? Is this my preferences? Is this my hangups? If it's about you, that may be another one where it's like, you know what? I'm going to let this go because I know it's actually about me, not about us. So anything that's me, not us is another place where you might be able to go. You know what? I don't need to get this one all the way to, to perfect. Yeah. That really good opportunities to reflect on ourselves yeah. as well. Yeah. So important. So important. And again, you know, you might do that 
five minutes into a conversation where all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, let's do a do-over. It may be, you know, in the shower the next morning, you're like, oh, that's not what I should have said. It, it's okay to go back and say, I blew that. That's not how I wanted to show up in that conversation. I, I think I left that conversation not really understanding what matters to you. Can we revisit it? It's okay if it's not right in the first place. But when you have that reflection, when you have the courage to say, hey, what do I need to own from how that went? Um, you'll have many, many more opportunities to set things right. Some great things to think about. Thanks so much, Leanne. Oh, my pleasure, Meg.